The Man in the Iron Mask by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Nine: The Tempter. My prince," said Aramis, turning in the carriage towards his companion, "weak creature as I am, so unpretending in genius, so low in the scale of intelligent beings." It has never yet happened to me to converse with a man without penetrating his thoughts through that living mask which has been thrown over our mind, in order to retain its expression. But to-night, in this darkness, in the reserve which you maintain, I can read nothing on your features, and something tells me that I shall have great difficulty in wresting from you a sincere declaration. I beseech you, then, not for love of me, for subjects should never weigh as anything in the balance which princes hold, but for love of yourself, to retain every syllable, every inflection which, under the present most grave circumstances, will all have a sense and value as important as any ever uttered in the world. I listen, replied the young prince, decidedly, without either eagerly seeking or fearing anything that you are about to say to me and he buried himself still deeper in the thick cushions of the carriage, trying to deprive his companion not only of the sight of him, but even of the very idea of his presence. Black was the darkness which fell wide and dense from the summits of the intertwining trees. The carriage, covered in by this prodigious roof, would not have received a particle of light, not even if a ray could have struggled through the wreaths of mist that were already rising in the avenue. Monseigneur, resumed Aramis, you know the history of the government which today controls France. The king issued from an infancy imprisoned like yours, obscure as yours, and confined as yours, only, instead of ending, like yourself, this slavery in a prison, this obscurity in solitude, these straitened circumstances in concealment, he was fain to bear all these miseries humiliations and distresses in full daylight under the pitiless sun of royalty on an elevation flooded with light where every stain appears a blemish every glory a stain the king has suffered it rankles in his mind and he will avenge himself he will be a bad king i say not that he will pour out his people's blood like louis the eleventh or charles the ninth for he has no mortal injuries to avenge, but he will devour the means and substance of his people, for he has himself undergone wrongs in his own interest and money. In the first place, then, I acquit my conscience when I consider openly the merits and the faults of this great prince, and if I condemn him, my conscience absolves me. Aramis paused. It was not to listen if the silence of the forest remained undisturbed, but it was to gather up his thoughts from the very bottom of his soul, to leave the thoughts he had uttered sufficient time to eat deeply into the mind of his companion. "'All that heaven does, heaven does well,' continued the Bishop of Vaughan, "'and I am so persuaded of it that I have long been thankful to have been chosen depository of the secret which I have aided you to discover.' to a just providence was necessary an instrument, at once penetrating, persevering, and convinced, to accomplish a great work. I am this instrument. I possess penetration, perseverance, conviction. I govern a mysterious people, who has taken for its motto the motto of God, Patiens Kia Oeternus. The prince moved. I divine, Monseigneur, why you are raising your head, and are surprised at the people I have under my command. You did not know you were dealing with a king. <laughs> oh, Monseigneur, king of a people very humble, much disinherited. Humble because they have no force save when creeping. Disinherited because never, almost never in this world, do my people reap the harvest they sow, nor eat the fruit they cultivate. They labor for an abstract idea. They heap together all the atoms of their power, to from a single man. And round this man, with the sweat of their labor, they create a misty halo, which his genius shall, in turn, 
render a glory gilded with the rays of all the crowns in Christendom. Such is the man you have beside you, Monseigneur. It is to tell you that he has drawn you from the abyss for a great purpose, to raise you above the powers of the earth, above himself. Footnote. The Latin motto translates as, He is patient because he is eternal. It is from St. Augustine. This motto was sometimes applied to the papacy, but not to the Jesuits. End of footnote. The prince slightly touched Aramis's arm. You speak to me, he said, of that religious order whose chief you are. For me, the result of your words is, that the day you desire to hurl down the man you shall have raised, the event will be accomplished, and that you will keep under your hand your creation of yesterday. Undeceive yourself, Monseigneur, replied the bishop. I should not take the trouble to play this terrible game with your royal highness, if I had not a double interest in gaining it. The day you are elevated, you are elevated forever. You will overturn the footstool, as you rise, and will send it rolling so far, that not even the sight of it will ever again recall to you its right to simple gratitude. Oh, monsieur! Your movement, monseigneur, arises from an excellent disposition. I thank you. Be well assured. I aspire to more than gratitude. I am convinced that, when arrived at the summit, you will judge me still more worthy to be your friend. And then, Monseigneur, we too will do such great deeds that ages hereafter shall long speak of them. Tell me plainly, Monsieur, tell me without disguise, what I am to-day, and what you aim at my being to-morrow. You are the son of King Louis the Thirteenth, brother of Louis the Fourteenth, natural and legitimate heir to the throne of France. In keeping you near him, as Monsieur has been kept, Monsieur, your younger brother, the king reserved to himself the right of being legitimate sovereign. The doctors only could dispute his legitimacy, but the doctors always prefer the king who is to the king who is not. Providence has willed that you should be persecuted. This persecution to-day consecrates you, King of France. You had, then, a right to reign, seeing that it is disputed. You had a right to be proclaimed, seeing that you have been concealed. And you possess royal blood, since no one has dared to shed yours, as that of your servants has been shed. Now see, then, what this providence— which you have so often accused of having in every way thwarted you, has done for you. It has given you the features, figure, age, and voice of your brother, and the very causes of your persecution are about to become those of your triumphant restoration. Tomorrow, after tomorrow, from the very first, regal phantom, living shade of Louis the Fourteenth, you will sit upon his throne, whence the will of heaven, confided in execution to the arm of man, will have hurled him without hope of return. "'I understand,' said the prince. "'My brother's blood will not be shed, then.' "'You will be the sole arbiter of his fate. "'The secret of which they made an evil use against me?' "'You will employ it against him. "'What did he do to conceal it? "'He concealed you.' Living image of himself, you will defeat the conspiracy of Mazarin and Anne of Austria. You, my prince, will have the same interest in concealing him, who will, as a prisoner, resemble you, and as you will resemble him as a king. I fall back on what I was saying to you. Who will guard him? Who guarded you? You know this secret. You have made use of it with regard to myself. Who else knows it? The Queen Mother and Madame de Chevreuse. What will they do? Nothing, if you choose. How is that? How can they recognize you, if you act in such a manner that no one can recognize you? Tis true. But there are grave difficulties. State them, Prince. My brother is married. I cannot take my brother's wife. 
I will cause Spain to consent to a divorce. It is in the interest of your new policy. It is human morality. All that is really noble and really useful in this world will find its account therein. The imprisoned king will speak. To whom do you think he will speak? To the walls? You mean, by walls, the men in whom you put confidence? If need be, yes. And besides, your royal highness? Besides? I was going to say that the designs of Providence do not stop on such a fair road. Every scheme of this calibre is completed by its results, like a geometrical calculation. The king, in prison, will not be for you the cause of embarrassment that you have been for the king enthroned. His soul is naturally proud and impatient. It is, moreover, disarmed and enfeebled by being accustomed to honours, and by the licence of supreme power. The same providence which has willed that the concluding step in the geometrical calculation I have had the honour of describing to your royal highness should be your ascension to the throne, and the destruction of him who is hurtful to you, has also determined that the conquered one shall soon end both his own and your sufferings. Therefore, his soul and body have been adapted for but a brief agony. Put into prison as a private individual, left alone with your doubts, deprived of everything, you have exhibited the most sublime, enduring principle of life in withstanding all this. But your brother, a captive, forgotten, and in bonds, will not long endure the calamity, and heaven will resume his soul at the appointed time, that is to say, soon. At this point in Aramis's gloomy analysis, a bird of night uttered from the depths of the forest that prolonged and plaintive cry which makes every creature tremble. "'I will exile the deposed king,' said Philippe, shuddering. "'Twill be more human.' "'The king's good pleasure will decide the point,' said Aramis. "'But has the problem been well put? Have I brought out of the solution according to the wishes or the foresight of your royal highness?' "'Yes, monsieur, yes. You have forgotten nothing, except indeed two things the first let us speak of it at once with the same frankness we have already conversed in let us speak of the causes which may bring about the ruin of all the hopes we have conceived let us speak of the risks we are running they would be immense infinite terrific insurmountable if as i have said all things did not concur to render them of absolutely no account. There is no danger either for you or for me, if the constancy and intrepidity of your royal highness are equal to that perfection of resemblance to your brother which nature has bestowed upon you. I repeat it. There are no dangers, only obstacles. A word, indeed, which I find in all languages, but have always ill understood, and, were I king, would have obliterated as useless and absurd. Yes, indeed, monsieur, there is a very serious obstacle, an insurmountable danger, which you are forgetting. Ah! said Aramis. There is conscience, which cries aloud, remorse that never dies. True, true, said the bishop. There is a weakness of heart of which you remind me. You are right, too, for that, indeed, is an immense obstacle. The horse, afraid of the ditch, leaps into the middle of it and is killed. The man who, trembling, crosses his sword with that of another, leaves loopholes whereby his enemy has him in his power. "'Have you a brother?' said the young man to Aramis. "'I am alone in the world.' said the latter, with a hard, dry voice. "'But surely there is some one in the world whom you love,' added Philippe. "'No one. Yes, I love you.' The young man sank into so profound a silence that the mere sound of his respiration seemed like a roaring tumult for Aramis. "'Monseigneur,' he resumed, "'I have not said all I had to say to your royal highness,' 
I have not offered you all of the salutary counsels and useful resources which I have at my disposal. It is useless to flash bright visions before the eyes of one who seeks and loves darkness. Useless, too, is it to let the magnificence of the cannon's roar make itself heard in the ears of one who loves repose and the quiet of the country. Monseigneur, I have your happiness spread out before me in my thoughts. Listen to my words, precious they indeed are, in their import and their sense, for you who look with such tender regard upon the bright heavens, the verdant meadows, the pure air. I know a country instinct with delights of every kind, an unknown paradise, a secluded corner of the world, where alone, unfettered and unknown, in the thick covert of the woods, amidst flowers and streams of rippling water, you will forget all the misery that human folly has so recently allotted you. Oh, listen to me, my prince. I do not jest. I have a heart, and mind, and soul, and can read your own, I, even to its depths. I will not take you unready for your task, in order to cast you into the crucible of my own desires, of my caprice, or my ambition. Let it be all or nothing. You are chilled and galled, sick at heart, overcome by excess of the emotions which but one hour's liberty has produced in you. For me, that is a certain and unmistakable sign that you do not wish to continue at liberty. Would you prefer a more humble life, a life more suited to your strength? Heaven is my witness that I wish your happiness to be the result of the trial to which I have exposed you. Speak, speak, said the prince, with a vivacity which did not escape Aramis. I know, resumed the prelate, in the bas Poitou, a canton, of which no one in France suspects the existence. Twenty leagues of country is immense, is it not? Twenty leagues, Monseigneur, all covered with water and herbage, and reeds of the most luxuriant nature, the whole studded with islands covered with woods of the densest foliage. These large marshes, covered with reeds as with a thick mantle, sleep silently and calmly beneath the sun's soft and genial rays. A few fishermen with their families indolently pass their lives away there, with their great living rafts of poplar and alder, the flooring formed of reeds, and the roof woven out of thick rushes. These barks, these floating houses, are wafted to and fro by the changing winds. Whenever they touch a bank, it is but by chance, and so gently, too, that the sleeping fisherman is not awakened by the shock. Should he wish to land, it is merely because he has seen a large flight of landrails or plovers, of wild ducks, teal, widgeon, or woodchucks, which fall an easy prey to net or gun. Silver shad, eels, greedy pike, red and grey mullet, swim in shoals into his nets. He has but to choose the finest and largest, and return the others to the waters. Never yet has the food of the stranger be he soldier or simple citizen, never has any one, indeed, penetrated into that district. The sun's rays there are soft and tempered. In plots of solid earth, whose soil is swart and fertile, grows the vine, nourishing with generous juice its purple, white, and golden grapes. Once a week, a boat is sent to deliver the bread which has been baked at an oven, the common property of all. There, like the seigneurs of early days, powerful in virtue of your dogs, your fishing lines, your guns, and your beautiful reed-built house, would you live, rich in the produce of the chase, in plentitude of absolute secrecy. There would years of your life roll away, at the end of which, no longer recognizable, for you would have been perfectly transformed. You would have succeeded in acquiring a destiny accorded to you by heaven. There are a thousand pistoles in this bag, Monseigneur, more, far more, than sufficient to purchase the whole marsh of which I have spoken, more than enough to live there as many years as you have days to live, more than enough to constitute you the richest, the freest, and the happiest man in the country. 
accept it, as I offer it you, sincerely, cheerfully. Forthwith, without a moment's pause, I will unharness two of my horses, which are attached to the carriage yonder, and they, accompanied by my servant, my deaf and dumb attendant, shall conduct you, travelling throughout the night, sleeping during the day, to the locality I have described, and I shall at least have the satisfaction of knowing that I have rendered to my prince the major service he himself preferred. I shall have made one human being happy, and heaven for that will hold me in better account than if I had made one man powerful. The former task is far more difficult. And now, Monseigneur, your answer to this proposition. Here is the money. Nay, do not hesitate. At Poitou you can risk nothing, except the chance of catching the fevers prevalent there, and even of them, the so-called wizards of the country will cure you for the sake of your pistoles. If you play the other game, you run the chance of being assassinated on a throne, strangled in a prison cell. Upon my soul, I assure you, now I begin to compare them together, I myself should hesitate which lot I should accept. Monsieur, replied the young prince, before I determine... Let me alight from this carriage, walk on the ground, and consult that still voice within me, which heaven bids us all to hearken to. Ten minutes is all I ask, and then you shall have your answer. As you please, Monseigneur, said Aramis, bending before him with respect, so solemn and august in tone and address had sounded these strange words. End of chapter